depends upon many conditions coming together. So that's interdependence. And the most important level of interdependence, you know, for our life, our, our life to be alive requires so many conditions that we usually take for granted. Um, so it's Thursday today, and I was thinking about this teaching. On, uh, I was doing some preparation on Tuesday. It was Tuesday evening, and <clears throat> I was thinking about what I was going to say, and I was studying some material, and I thought to myself, oh, I better check. I need to check my uh, WeChat account. I don't check it every day, and I thought it might be something, something important. Or, you know, just, I have to check it. Um, so I checked my this, so this, uh, this social network, and I saw a message from a friend, and she, she had said um, that her husband uh, and son were in a uh, so the first thing she put were in a very bad auto accident, and so this uh, so this family I'm very close with. Um, I've stayed with them many many times. Uh, so I, I consider them very you know, uh, like dear friends. So the first thing I thought, oh, what happened? Are they okay? What happened? And then and then she and then the next thing she said, um, the, so the car was in a terrible auto accident. Traveling in a truck, and um, they um, this happened. In, uh, it was very cold. They were in Cape Cod. They were going down uh, like a um, uh, like a highway or something, and they hit uh, black ice. So the car spit out of control, or the truck spit out of control, um, and flipped over, uh, and it came came back, it hit a few small trees, and it, and it came back, kind of flipped over, and then landed right side up. And uh, Rick, the father, said to the son, are you okay? And uh, Pearson, the son, said, I'm fine. They got out of the car and they walked away. And so, so Amy had posted that, uh, that they're okay. And so I thought to myself, uh, and you know, of course, for, for Buddhists, we contemplate we, we contemplate impermanence and death uh, every day. So I just I just uh, I felt so grateful that they were in this horrible car accident, but they were unscathed. The, the truck was told, and then I called them and talked to them, and they were fine. And so then I thought to myself, Man, this is the most important thing to, about our lives that we take for granted, is that it depends on so many causes and conditions for us to stay alive. And so that's something uh, precious. It's something really, really precious. Uh, so where does our, you know, if you just, so our life depends upon our bodies. And this, this life, depends upon uh, our minds taking the birth in this body. And so if you go back, so you know, where did this body come from? You know, um, we didn't produce it ourselves. And so this is so this comes from the interdependence, the coming together um, of our parents. So our body is the is completely dependent, its existence depends upon the kindness of others. If it weren't for the kindness of our parents, we wouldn't have this body, we wouldn't have this life. And then as you know, as you all know, um, when we're born into this world, we can, as, as young children, we cannot survive on our own. We're only alive, especially when we're children, the only way we can survive is due to the kindness of others. And principally, that, uh, that person is our mother. 
without the mother's kindness principally, but it could be it could be a nanny, uh, it could be babysitters, or I mean, there's all kinds of people, but it's principally her mother, without their care and nurture. Yeah, we're, we were born with clothes. We weren't born with food to eat. Where do all these things come from? So, to for us to exist in the world, we depend upon the kindness and many, many other people. And then, as we grow up, it's not just our parents. Then, to survive, we have to we have to learn the ways of the world. So, where does that come from? We have to learn the language. Our, our parents, then our teachers. The fact that we can interact in using the English language depends upon the kindness of our teachers. If I can speak in somewhat good English and you can understand me, if you think about it, this depends upon so many, uh, the kindness of so many teachers in our lives that we don't now, you know, it's long, like for me, it's a long time ago now. But our language skills, our cognitive skills, uh, everything depends upon the kindness of others. So interdependence actually is closely connected with the Buddhist um, teaching on selflessness. So everybody knows, you know, in Buddhism we talk about selflessness. Everybody knows about selflessness. Some, something. Sometimes, some, you know, sometimes we translate it no self. You know, but if you just if you if you just tell people about selflessness or no self, it sounds a little bit clinical. You know, it, it doesn't sound very personal. And usually, it's expressed in these philosophical like in, we use kind of philosophical vocabulary to express this idea that this notion of ourselves as independent, separate individuals, autonomous beings, individuals, is an illusion. It doesn't, it doesn't exist in the way we think it does. And to the extent that we think that this, we we are these, these self-sufficient individuals that don't depend upon others. To the extent that we think this, it, this creates uh, selfish thinking. It creates a kind of um, short-sighted attitude where we think that we're the only, if, you know, we don't really see the kindness of others and this interdependence of for, our, for us to continue living, we depend on so many people. I'm, I'm, of course, I've just began, you know, we can describe this on, we can, I can go on all night, we can trace all kinds of levels of interdependence. Um, everything in our lives depends upon the kindness of others. But if we don't think about that, we can fall into this kind of selfish uh, mentality thinking that we're the only ones who really matter. I can take care of myself. And then we, we forget the kindness that others have extended to us consciously and unconsciously. So it's on so many levels. Like, if you look at me, like I was talking about clothing, you know, we all need clothes. Where did the clothes come from? We make the clothes ourselves. The clothing comes from others. And like my clothes, probably your clothes too, um, these were made in Nepal mostly. And so it has to pass through. Somebody actually made these clothes. And I don't know, we don't usually know the people who made our clothes. And they sometimes they pass through many hands could be assembled in factories. And then they finally either we purchase them or they're given to us. But this is so this is this um, an this is an example of interdependence. So we're clothed now because of the kindness and hard work of others. 
we don't recognize that, we take those others, their, their, their work, and they're, so we're, we're connected with these people intimately, so close. If we don't, but if we don't remember that kindness and their hard work uh, to support our lives, like for the, using this example of clothing, clothing um, we don't, we don't, if something bad happens to others, we don't really, we kind of think, well, it's not my, it's not my business. Uh, and so we have this kind of uh, self-cherishing attitude. It, this leads to uh, a mentality that I and mine is the most important. And what happens to others maybe isn't, you know, we think, well, it's not my concern. We think my, you know, my body, maybe my family. If you have a family, you, you, you naturally are concerned about your family. If you have children, you know, you, you love your children. But do we extend that to others beyond our family, beyond our friends, beyond our race, beyond our species? How, how much can we extend our concern to others? Because we don't, if we, when we have we fall into this uh, selfish thinking through egotism, through uh, thinking that we're the most important, we're kind of like we think we're like the center of the world. It's like we put out walls, and it's like we become very small. You know, if you're if you're in, if you're part of my world, then you're important to me. But if you're not, maybe we, there's a danger that we become apathetic to the suffering of others. But, so the way things really are, in terms of interdependence and selflessness, is, so others are part of us. Because we depend so much on others. We are, so others are part of us, they are part of, uh, and we are part of them as well. And it's not just, it's, it's Teaching was about like so social. Um, what did I say? Independence, social responsibility, but it's actually and so. But even the environment, where we have this relationship of interdependence as well. So for us to so you know so this the most precious thing we have is our life. Life depends upon breathing. We stop breathing, we die. And there's a, there's a great Buddhist master, Nagarjuna. Probably most of you, if you're, if you're, if you're Buddhist practitioners, Nagarjuna is really famous. You see, like he's like the father of the Mahayana. And he said something like in one of his teachings, he said, he said, it's a great wonder that we go to bed at night and we wake up in the morning and we're still breathing. I'm kind of paraphrasing. I don't. I don't remember the exact quotation. And because he said the difference between life and, and, and death is simply this, this breath. When when the breathing stops, we die. And so he, so he said in this in this teaching, he said, so we, it's a great wonder we wake up every morning, and it's incredible. We're still we're still breathing. We're still alive. We take it for granted, and Nagarjuna said, we can't take this for granted. This, so where does, so we need to talk about this interdependence more, about dependence upon the environment. So, the, so our breath depends upon the oxygen. Where does the oxygen come from? Is it our, you know, do we produce that oxygen for ourselves? Do human beings mass produce it and we buy it? 
we don't actually we don't think about these things. We don't think about it, if, unless you're Buddhist, of course. Um, Buddhists think about these things. So so the oxygen oxygen comes from the trees, and trees depend on the earth. So if you think about so we're nourished, we can only survive in dependence upon the kindness, even of, of the of the 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 inanimate world. So these trees uh, that many human beings are uh, cutting down um, in massive numbers uh, with reckless abandon, our life depends upon those trees. Those trees produce oxygen, and so those so we our lives depend upon those trees, and then we put out carbon. Uh, it's a carbon dioxide. And then, so the tree, we nourish the trees in that way. So we have this relationship of interdependence, not only with each and every living being in this world, but the the, the earth and the trees nourishes us. So what part of this ecosystem but we take it for granted? And if we think that, and if we don't, if we don't recognize that dependence that we we can act in a selfish manner in a short short-sighted manner so we have when we have people um, and they think if I cut down the trees or we have like or, you know businesses people corporations we need the natural resources and if they don't if you're not thinking carefully we just cut down the trees Produce paper and and wood to build things. All kind, you know, all kind, whatever we use to treat the natural resources. Let's say of the trees for. And if we if, if we don't think carefully about the results of our actions, um, it will have a negative impact upon ourselves and others. So we cut down all this. If we cut down all the trees. What's going to happen to all the species who, that's their ecosystem? We're causing their extinction. So when we're, when we're selfish and short-sighted and we don't think about this level of interdependence, um, we make mistakes. And those mistakes can uh, have a negative impact upon not only ourselves, but because we're all in, because we're all interrelated, like in this vast web, um, those mistakes, because of our short-sightedness and our selfishness, uh, can affect a great many uh, living beings and other species, right? So we we're alive today. And basically, what, we're, what we all want more than anything else, we have, this, we have this basic wish to be happy. I mean, if, when, you come right, when it comes right down to it, we just want to be happy. And this is, our, this is like our shared humanity. This is our shared, all, all beings want this. Um, what we think makes us happy, maybe people have different ideas about this, but we all want this happiness. But if we, if we go about, if we think about acquiring happiness for ourselves alone, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Our ha- because our happiness, our, because our life depends upon the kindness of others. And so if you recognize this, you will be equally, or in the case of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, you will be even, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are even, they're more concerned with the welfare of others. But at least we should be thinking, how do my actions impact others? And we, we, we need to think about the welfare of others. And so when we, when we, when we understand 
that this autonomous self is an illusion. And that each and every being is part of us. We are part of them. Then we begin to think, what can I do to pr promote the happiness of all beings? And when we start, when we begin to think that way, because if others are suffering, we can't really be happy. Because we know, now, you know, we, we now have talked about this, just giving a few examples. Our, you know, others are linked to us. It's like when, when, a, when a parent has a child and the child suffers, that parent feels distraught. Until the child is, and their child is made happy, um, the parent will not have any happiness. And that's how the Buddhists think about all beings. And so we have to we have to overcome this idea that other beings, the happiness of other beings doesn't matter to us. And and the suffering of other beings also doesn't so we, we this apathy, especially toward we see this every day, the, to the suffering of others. We we can't we can't help but notice this way. If you, you all live in New York City, I, I live in Albany, you can see it in Albany, you know, there's plenty of homeless people. And we see their suffering every day. But we become, it's very easy to kind of uh, become apathetic. We think, well, it's not my business. But we're intimately related intimately connected, whether we know it or not. And so we have to think about the, 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 the benefit and welfare of other beings. And at least think they, they are as important as I am. And of course, for the Buddhists and Bodhisattvas, like I said, as I said before, they become other sentient beings, other sentient beings become even more important. And so when you have this mentality, then when we can contribute to the happiness of others, and we can lessen their suffering, that itself is our happiness. That itself is our joy. And so my teacher, um, Chapter Chong uh, he said, he said I put this. I put this in a lot of places. I have this on my, in my, my email. I have, I have like a little business card uh, you know, that I give people as a Buddhist monk, as a teacher, and I have this. Like, and he says, "Do you want to be happy? It's so easy. Help others." So that's really so that's all I wanted to talk about. Um, I think we should have some questions. I don't, if, if I go on too long, it maybe get it'll get too complicated. We can. I don't want to make it too complicated. But before I close, I want to give you a quotation from one of the great bodhisattvas, and, and his, uh, his name was um, Shanti Deva. And Shakti Deva lives. He was an Indian uh, Buddhist monk who lived in the monastery. He lived at this monastery called Nalanda. Nalanda was very famous. In um, I don't, I'm not so certain about dates. You know, um, when did Shakti Deva live? Maybe around I think around eighth century of the Common Era. And so, and Nalanda was this great. Buddhist um, monastery, and there were thousands of monks uh, there, and it was like it was like it was like also it was like a big university. In the lot of you could like think Harvard, you know, think yeah, it was like that, you know, and they had all and they, so they really studied the texts and 
you know, they had a lot of monks and, uh, debating, and, and so um, Shantideva was one of the masters who lived there. But when he, when he was alive, and he was, at, he was a monk at Nalanda, he, he was very humble, so he, he hid his qualities. And so the, uh, so the other monks thought he was rather lazy because he didn't make a display of his learning and of his, you know, his greatness. He just, he had a hum, uh, very kind of um, uh, humble demeanor. And so people thought he was kind of lazy. Uh, but they asked him to give this teaching. And the teaching that he gave this teaching, because they thought, well, he doesn't really know anything. And if, you know, if he has to give a teaching, he'll run away. But then, he said, okay, I'll give a teaching. And he gave this teaching, and uh, it's, the teaching is actually very famous now. Um, but at the end, uh, at the end of the teaching, he, he made this his aspiration for the world and for sentient beings. And so I have a quote for you that, that I want to end with before we have questions. Um, so it's, it's part of his, uh, his aspiration prayer uh, for future generations. Um, that is, I find very inspiring. So I'll read that to you. So, in the way of the Bodhisattva, Shantideva uh, prayed in this way May I, at all times, both now and forever, be a protector for those without protection. May it be a guide for those who have lost their way, a ship for those with oceans to cross, a bridge for those with rivers to cross, a sanctuary for those in danger, a lamp for those without light, and a place of refuge for those who lack shelter and a servant for all in need. This is Shanti Deva's prayer for the world and all sentient beings. So I wanted to offer that to you in, uh, in conclusion. If you have any questions, uh, I'll try, to, I'll try my best to answer. Let's talk, is it? We have some more time. Do you have any questions? In the, in the back? Um, is it okay to know too much about you? Uh, you could uh, let us know something about you, what tradition you're with, uh, how you came about to be a Um Well, uh, my history with Buddhism, um, now I'm kind of, I, I'm, I'm, I'm middle aged now, I'm now I'm, I'm in my 50s. Um, I've been um, I wasn't a monk until 2008, but I became interested in Buddhism when I was uh, 16 or 17 years old. And I grew up in New Jersey, and I, especially at that time, there weren't, there weren't many Buddhist centers, there weren't many Buddhist teachers, there wasn't much. And so the only thing I knew to do was I went to, you know, I would go to a bookstore. And you know, I wanted answers to life. And I started looking, so I started studying about Western philosophy. And then that didn't satisfy me. I thought I should study Eastern philosophy. And at some point, I, I was in high school at the time, and I went to the, the high school library, and I saw a book on Buddhism. And it was just called Buddhism. And because uh, at, at that time it wasn't now it now it's totally different. If you if you look for books on Buddhism, it's like it's overwhelming. But in those days, there wasn't very much. And this is an old book. It wasn't uh, probably wasn't translated very well. It was, it was actually I think it was published uh, maybe in the 30s or 40s. It wasn't you know. Um, in it, but in any case, I read this book, and I somehow I knew. I, I must be Buddhist. And then, <clears throat> so I started searching around for a teacher. I didn't meet my main teacher until 1990, 
<coughs> to uh, Trogor Bichek, who is a, um, who's a uh, he's still alive now, to the uh, Tibetan Lama. Um, and I, met, I went to a teaching of his. And um, I've, been, I've been studying before. I started out actually in, in uh, what they now call Shambhala. found out about Trump Rinpoche, I was um, living in Seattle at the time, and I went to see him, he was teaching in Vancouver, and I went to see him, and I thought, I, I really felt, oh, I must study with him. And so I asked for an interview, and I said, will you be my teacher? And he said, sure. <laughs> and that kind of really started the process rolling. And I started studying, uh, I was working at the time, and I started, to, he encouraged me to study um, Buddhist philosophy, and I was also started to study Tibetan language. And I went to study in India and Nepal. Uh, when I, I, I got to, my father had passed away, and I got some like small inheritance, and so I went to study uh, at, um, extensively in India and Nepal. Buddhist philosophy and Tibetan language. And then when I came back and I kept studying, and then I uh, went to retreat. Um, I did retreat in, in uh, upstate New York. And kind of like how I got to Albany is like after that retreat, then one of my teachers had been asked me to go um, teach in Albany. There's a small center in Albany. And I got to, I'm, um, I got out of the retreat in 2008, and I developed the wish to become, because my teacher, uh, my most, my, my main teacher, Trang is the, uh, like the main, you could say, monastic preceptor or abbot in our lineage, the country lineage. So, so he was, of course, he was a big influence on me. So I developed this wish. And then in 2008, I went to take, I took my vows with uh, Trung Rinpoche in Nepal. And so I've been a monk since 2008. And I've been teaching, I have, been, I have a small, we have a small center in Albany where I teach, but I, then I also teach in other centers. So, um, actually it's not very, the rest of my life's not very interesting. <laughs> but that's a little bit. Yes. How do you define what help is? Because a lot of times, if you in some of like in parent child relationships, right? Because I remember when I was a teenager, my dad tried to help me. I was highly resistant. You what? I was resist resistant to my dad helping me with stuff. You know, it wasn't until much later that I was like, oh, I, you know, now I know what you were trying to do. And at the time, I wasn't appreciative. Well, this, yeah, this is the problem. We yeah. don't recognize the kindness of others. Yeah. Um, and so in, so in Buddhism, um, the way we remedy this is through um, recollecting. We say, recollect the kindness of others. And in dependence upon that recollection of kindness, uh, love arises. So when I say love, of course I'm not speaking about romantic love. It's more like loving kindness. This it's the it's the wish for for others to be happy. Um, and so so it's said that love arises. It's appreciation for others and the wish that they be happy arises uh, based upon recollecting. And so, so that's why it's important to, to, to consciously uh, think about these connections uh, with so many beings that they, they extend some kind of kindness to others. And sometimes they're not even aware of it. So people do things for us that help us. And maybe it's just part of their job, but still we're dependent upon their, their kindness. We don't see it that way, but we're dependent upon and so when we recollect this, um, the, this kindness of others, uh, it makes us feel gratitude. And that gratitude um, 
will nurture the wish to help others. That will nurture it, 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 the, that gratitude. Um, will, based upon that, we develop this love uh, for others. But it's something uh, we have to develop. That's why we have um, like meditation. On, you, you heard about the four in Mahayana. We call it four immeasurables. In the, in the, Theravada and the uh, uh, foundation of Vilgo, I think it's it's called four Brahma Viharas. It's the same. So the four, uh, which means four abodes of Brahma, uh, or four, four in, in America, my, in my call it four limitless thoughts or four immeasurable attitudes. So they are um, the conscious cultivation of love. Compassion, sympathetic joy, and impartiality or equanimity. Um, the first one is love. Um, so we meditate. Usually, we meditate on love first. And this, and this, then meditating on love, then we develop this wish to repay the kindness of others. Sometimes we don't, you know, oftentimes, we don't recollect that kindness. Then there's a danger we take, we take others for granted. Sometimes even people, I mean, it's a good, it's a good point, but like with your, sometimes even our parents, our parents do so much for us. But sometimes we end up arguing with them. You know, we can't, we don't, we don't get along, and many people don't get along with their parents. But this, this, this really comes from not, you know, we don't reckon, uh, and we don't really recollect their, their kindness to us. And then in Buddhism, actually, we go a step further. But in Buddhism, we talk about a rebirth, we talk about past and future lives. So when you, you know, when you discuss past and the connections that we have from past, past lives, then, from that perspective, the connections are also infinite. So then we say there's no one who's not been a, a mother to us, a father, a brother, sister, you know, a relative, a friend. We have so many, we have connections with each and every being, but they're from the past, you know, the previous life we don't remember, and so for granted. Uh, but in Buddhism, we then we think about that connection as well, and then we, to, to we consciously cultivate um, gratitude in, in connection uh, with that as well, in that, in that way. Uh, but even for people who don't believe, uh, you know, many Westerners don't believe, you know, uh, in, in past and future lives, rebirth and karma, um, it's easier to talk about this uh, through um, the reasoning, of, giving giving the, the reasoning of interdependence. The way the way I did in the beginning of the teaching. Yes. So, are you suggesting that the link between interdependence and karma that we what you were just highlighting? Then, could you maybe talk more about that if you have time? <clears throat> well, the karma, the karma and interdependence go, also go together. Karma is the idea that what we do, uh, our actions, our deeds, uh, have potency, they have power, and will bring certain results. Um, and those results, uh, uh, the quality of those results depend upon the quality of our actions. So if we do good things, we get, we, we we will get good results. And we, we, it's like we sow, we, you know, we, we sow uh, goodness. We, sow, we, we create positive actions with our body, speech, and mind. The result of that in the future, in, in this life or future lives, must be um, some kind of happiness. We do bad things, the result of that 
some way, have, it, it's, uh, it's going to be suffering. Um, so actually, karma and interdependence are connected. Um, but karma is like a whole other thing. But this weekend, I'm talking about karma. Um, it's, it gets very, karma, karma gets very, very, uh, it's very detailed. It kind of gets complicated. Yes. Could you speak a little about kindness and gratitude and the hatred of Trump? And I, I mean, <laughs> now, now you then, 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 then this is uh, this is this may, this is this is the hard part because um, then the, basically, but what you're asking about is um, you know any anyone who we don't agree with or create some kind of problem for us or for others. Um, and so, you know, I mean, there are people who create harm. And, uh, but from the Buddhist perspective, um, we, because we're also, we're, because we're related to all these beings, um, we, we, we also need to help them. We, and, and but also the kindness is just, is kind of if we think about it from a, from a large kind of large scale perspective, those who, in just in general, we're not talking about Trump specifically, it could be anyone, uh, those who create let's say create problems for other people, or might harm us or others, especially in their, in their own positions of power, um, they weren't always like that. That they developed that way over time, and at one point, you know, they they um, they also helped many other people, and so we have. There's no being. I mean, there's no being in this world we don't have connection for it, with. And like so, but, but giving the example of Trump, we have this interdependence that he's actually the U.S. president, whether we like it or not. There's nothing we can do. So, we, you know, it's like. Like from a Buddhist perspective, we have to pray for him. We have to try to help him. Um, but he wasn't always like people who make have short-sighted view and just in general do things that have a negative impact upon, let's say, large groups of people or you know, like the planet. Who, um, Table the sound, but that could be some kind of suffering, or some kind of distress. Any, in any case, um, we have to nurture goodness, uh, especially in relation to the people that, that um, we don't like or may harm us uh, or the world in general. There's many, there's a lot of people like that. There's a, um, a lot of people, a lot like corporations and you know, they're just, they're destroying the environment because of greed. You know, they want money. They want profits. You know, so it's just, it's just, so we actually, we can relate to that in some way. You know, this is just this short-sighted thinking, and they're not thinking about the, the good of the planet, you're not thinking about the well-being, you know, it's like we talk about, and like, like in the age of Trump, we, like Trump talks about America first, but actually that's an erroneous concept, especially, you know, we live in this global society, and it doesn't matter what happens in Canada, so all the economies are interdependent, interrelated. If there's, let's, you know, if there's, well, there's a big earthquake in Mexico, you know, like there was an earthquake, uh, when did it happen? Just in the last year, you know, that, that, that affects us. They're part of us. We're not, it's like we're not cut off from Mexico. We're all, you know, it's like we're all this, this big family. 
Karen. So we have to, you know, uh, even though if we disagree with others, so we have to also think um, about disagreeing with the actions, but the actions are different than the individual. You know, the people who do bad things, they can, they can also do good things. It's not, it's like, there's, there's no one who's totally, you know, totally evil. Um, but they have their priorities wrong. They have a very short-term view. So if we recognize that, um, then we can, you know, we can help. You know, if we, if, we, if we just label another being as like totally, you know, they're, they're totally misguided, um, they'll never change. Um, we just give up on them. That's not the Buddhist way. And we, can't, we can't do that. We have responsibility. And sometimes we can't make a difference, but you know, at least we can pray for them. Um, but we said we can't, we should never give up on other beings. And then sometimes it happens that some beings in, in uh, beginning of their life they do many bad things but then they um, something happens to them and then they they change in a positive way and they could help up and they can end up helping many people this, this also happens there's a story I was talking about, a little after I have to tell a little uh, this little story <clears throat> in Buddhism there's one of the disciples of the Buddha. This is, now we're going back to the time of the Buddha. His name was Angulimala. And Angulimala is a Sanskrit name. And it means garland. In, in Tibetan, he's, it's, it means something like garland of fingers. And the, and the reason why he got this name is when he was young, he, he found a Brahmin teacher. He was, he, was, he was very young. Before he met the Buddha, he before he became a monk, he found this Brahmin teacher. And this Brahmin teacher uh, had a very beautiful wife. And, and, um, and he was very devoted to this, um, he was very devoted to this Brahmin teacher. But the Brahmin te teacher's wife um, uh, took a liking to Angulimala, or who would become Angulimala. And uh, she made some kind of romantic overture. To him, but being the student of this teacher, he rebuffed her, and he's because I can't, I can't do this, and and she she became upset, and she kind of like um, kind of like um, disheveled her clothes, and then when the, the her husband came back, the Brahmin teacher, she said that Angulimala tried to, to seduce her, and, you know. Uh, which was a lie, and the the Brahmin teacher became really enraged, and he's and he thought, and but he was very devoted to this Brahmin teacher. Thought, but you know, would do whatever he said, and he said, you know, if you really want to transform yourself, you have to go out, and you need to kill one thousand people, and when you kill them cut off their finger and make a garland of fingers. And so, and he, he, he was, uh, you know, he was like a, a, a mass murderer for the, you know, for ancient times in India. Uh, so people, naturally, people heard about him and they were terrified. And when he, wherever he came around, the news got around, they would hide. Um, but then he had, you know, he had trouble finding, the, so he had 999 uh, fingers, a garland of fingers. Uh, and but he had trouble finding the last one, and and the Buddha saw his situation. Of course, the Buddha was not afraid of him. And the Buddha deliberately came into his into uh, his path, and so the Buddha was going to be his thousand, uh, you know, one thousand victim. And the Buddha, because um, he came after the Buddha, and the Buddha's and he could never, he could never quite catch up with the Buddha as fast as you know. Buddha was walking away, 
and he started running after the Buddha, but however fast he ran after the Buddha, he couldn't keep up. It's like, something's, what's, what's with this person? And then he finally yelled out and he said, stop, Angulimala, to the Buddha. And the Buddha said something like, I stopped a long time ago. <laughs> what about you? And, you know, because he's dealing with the Buddha, um, and he saw his mind the, the, through the Buddha's uh, intervention and his blessing. He saw what that what he was doing was not good, and he recognized the, the Buddha as this extraordinary person. And then, uh, in that in that moment, he developed his Angulimala developed this, this intense regret. Yeah. So, because the Buddha saw his potential, right? So, Angulimala was not always like this, right? He, you know, he had this the teacher wanted to, you know, set him on a wrong path, you know. But the Buddha saw his potential. Buddha saw the, the the big picture. And so, you know, actually, it was if you know, it was, if it's this country or many other countries like China, we, in many states there's the death penalty. You know, Angulimala would have been killed. But the Buddha saw his potential, so Angulimala generated sincere regret in the presence of the Buddha. Then the Buddha ordained him as a monk, and Angulimala became, to make a long story short, he became an arhat. An, ar an arhat's like uh, uh, liberated uh, from samsara. They, they, they uh, freed themselves from the suffering of samsara. So Angulimala became like a saint, you know. So then we have, if we see the big picture, you know, anyone, Donald Trump or anyone who might be doing bad things, they didn't start out that way, you know. And um, you know, life. This is this is the from the Buddhist perspective. This is not the only life. They're not gonna. They're not always gonna be that way, you know. Um, so we pray that through the good causes and conditions and interdependence, these people can um, improve themselves. It happens all the time. But we, you know, we have to do our, you know, we can't just write people off. You know, no matter bad, how bad they seem, uh, we say in the Mahayana, there's no being who doesn't have some slight love for others, some slight compassion for others. And this is the seed. And so, so we say because beings naturally have some love and compassion, uh, that can be developed. So we have, it's like we have this as part of our nature, but it's usually, you take people like, like it's a, if you say like, you know, someone we consider really bad, you know, like Adolf Hitler. You know, it wasn't the case that they hated everyone. There was always someone, someone they can love. And so that's the seed uh, that can be developed. So because they have, because each and every, even the most vicious animal or predator or, or person, evil person, like Hitler, has the capacity to love others, it can be developed. It can be um, developed uh, so that it expands. And so when that love and that compassion, so, so love and compassion for ordinary beings like ourselves is limited. You know, it, it just, it's, it's for our family, our friends, you know, maybe our countrymen. It usually has a limit. It doesn't. And then beyond that, we don't care. But for a Buddha, love has no limit. So when love becomes limitless, that's Buddha. When compassion, when your compassion becomes limitless, that's Buddha. When wisdom becomes limitless and sees it, all the interconnections, all the all the relationships of 
all things just as it is, that's Buddha. So no one's, especially from the Mahayana perspective, no one's fundamentally evil or bad. And so therefore we can't give up. And we have to do our best to help others. Even some, but sometimes it takes the change takes a long time. We don't sometimes we don't see the change maybe in this, we don't see the change in this lifetime. That's possible. But we should never give up on others. Okay. Is there anything pressing? Maybe otherwise maybe we close. Yeah. But this is